Good morning, church. Good to be with you for another week of our online church service. If you're new, stopping by for the first time, welcome aboard. I pray you had a blessed week, and especially if you listen close this morning, I pray that you were able to uphold your status of being of more noble character than the Thessalonians this past week. If you remember Paul and Silas in Thessalonica, Paul's teaching in the synagogue in Acts chapter 17. If you get your Bibles, uh, keep them open. There will be a lot of scriptures in the message today. But in Acts 17 and verse 2, uh, Paul is teaching and proving from the scriptures, and that would be back there in that section someone labeled old, don't even get me started. He proved that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And all of that went all right, but it didn't end well. Some Jews were jealous, the scripture says, and they formed a mob and they started a riot. And they went to the city officials and they said, let us tell you what these guys are saying. Paul and Silas, they're going around defying Caesar's law. Caesar, the king, their king, not Paul and Silas. They're promoting some other king. They said they're telling us that there's another king, some guy named Jesus. So Paul and Silas had to escape, and as they left in the night to go to Berea, and Paul's going to go into the synagogue there and think, wow, is this going to happen again? But he gets a much better experience in Berea. In Acts 17, 11, we're told, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness. And they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, number, number one, how would you like to be from Thessalonica and to be forever etched in Scripture because of this one event that you are basically designated as being of less noble character than the Bereans? Now, I, I pray everyone watching follows the example of the Bereans. It's one of my goals as a, as a believer, as a Christian. Uh, I'll receive the message with eagerness, and, but I will examine the scriptures every day to see if what is being said is true. I pray you do the same. And, and to listen, not just to me, but anybody that preaches or teaches from God's Word or says anything from the Bible, don't you dare take anything that I say or anybody else for that matter when it comes to Scripture. Don't take it as truth until you examine Scriptures and test it and filter it through the Scriptures to make sure it's true. And that's especially important for today's challenge. Today's challenge where I pray we grow in our understanding of what I'm calling the Greater Commission. We talked a couple weeks back about the Commission, the Great Commission. Well, this this is different today, and I pray you bear with me. To accomplish that for the message this morning, I need to go back and use lots of scriptures. We're just going to let the Bible speak this morning. To establish, not to really establish, but to confirm history. And my most favorite part of all, to confirm the context, context, context of what we need to talk about this morning, to dig deeper. I'd like to encourage us to remove ourselves from the story, from the scriptures, and all that we've interpreted, and let's just allow the scriptures to tell us, to reveal the history that we need to know. It'll be quick, but hopefully you'll have time to dig deeper at a slower pace on your own. We start with this, in Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, all of God's people, and I would say all of God's people, uh, had been waiting anxiously for, for something very important to take place. They'd been waiting, in fact, for thousands of years, not those particular ones, but through generation after generation, they'd been waiting anxiously for the king that God promised would be coming for them. In fact, they they were holding on tightly to that promise. And so many of them had lost their hope. They had lost their faith. Many of them had lost their way, had strayed from the path of righteousness and staying connected and committed and, and following the law of God. And it's not difficult to understand why. It had been a long time. 
But they're holding to the promise that was given to their king David from old. God promised David a thousand years earlier. We find it in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. God tells David, says, listen, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, there's two words. They're the same word that need to be definitely highlighted, underlined, and circled forever. What does forever mean to you? God's people have been waiting a very long time for that king to arrive. The king that would reign forever over the kingdom that would last forever. And they're still waiting. The king that would sit on David's throne forever. So imagine, now let's go through the story. Imagine in Luke 1, we, we read this a lot at Christmas time, but it's so important, not just at Christmas time, every time. In Luke 1, verse 31 and 32, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Virgin Mary in Nazareth. And Gabriel has a message. He tells her, Mary, you're going to have a baby. It's going to be a boy. You're to name that boy Jesus. And then Gabriel tells her, Mary, he's going to be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. And then Gabriel says, And Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Any goosebumps yet? Imagine waiting so long and then to hear those words. Imagine when Jesus was born and, and the Magi, the wise men, traveled so many miles to Jerusalem and, and came to town and they started asking in Matthew 2, 2, where is he? Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and we've come to worship him. And I wonder, did they say king? The king of the Jews? How about now? Any goosebumps? Any goosebumps on what God is about to do when you hear these words and you remember why, if you're a Jew in that day, why you're holding on, waiting for God to fulfill His promise from long ago that a king will come for His people and a king will sit on David's throne and will be a king forever over a kingdom that lasts forever. Continuing on, imagine when Jesus grew up. And he went to the Jordan River and received that anointing that you would receive as a king. And he begins preaching. In Matthew 4 and verse 17, what was his message? Repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. Get ready. God's promise is about to be fulfilled. I wonder now, how about now? Any goosebumps? And Jesus will choose His disciples. And, and then to those twelve, he, he gives them the Great Commission. We find it in Matthew 10, verses 5 through 7. Jesus commands them. He says, I want you to go and I want you to preach that the message of the kingdom of heaven is near. Preach that. And Jesus commanded them, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, right here, I'm sure many might want to stop and correct me. Maybe to say, preacher, you got the wrong scripture. Uh, that's the wrong passage for the Great Commission. The Great Commission is in Matthew 28. In fact, it even says so in the heading right here in my Bible. I'm, in my heading, it says the Great Commission over there in Matthew 28. It's not Matthew 10. And I would say, well, fair enough. Now can I say, with gentleness, love, and respect, just to begin this little adventure this morning, every Bible heading that you have in your Bibles, before chapters and different passages or events, the, the heading that will describe what's about to take place in that particular part of the Bible, it's not part of the Bible. And you might say, no, it's part of the Bible right here. It's in my Bible. Look right here. It says the Great Commission is the heading. And I'd say, fine, <laughs> but it wasn't part of the Bible, the original. In fact, there were no chapters. There were no verses. In fact, from the original, they, they had no punctuation. Somebody had to sit down. Everything that you find now are things that have been put in by somebody, some man or some group of men or women. 
including the designation that divides the Bible, old and new. Don't get me started, but I'm, I'm first. Let me be the first. I'm not condemning or, or neglecting or rejecting or anything, disrespecting anything. I would be lost without those things in my Bible. It's so much easier to navigate through my Bible with those reference points. However, we better be like the Bereans. Diligently search the Scriptures. Rightly divide the word of truth. Be careful over everything that's been added for our help. Especially even punctuation. Imagine sitting down with a, just a continuous text of words and then trying to translate it into English where you need to determine where do the punctuation marks go. Is this person saying this with high emotion? Should there be an exclamation point or not? Is there a pause here? Should there be a comma? Is this where this sentence ends and this sentence begins? Imagine that task. And I'll tell you, here's an illustration I like to use uh, to, to illustrate the importance of punctuation marks and how a simple Placing of a punctuation can change the complete meaning of a sentence. You're at a family gathering. It's lunchtime. So people are starting to gather in the room, and someone says, you got to get grandma. So you go and you say, let's eat, grandma. Fair enough, and that's all good, because you used proper punctuation to the one that's writing it down, perhaps. There's a comma there, but imagine one small change in the punctuation can change the entire meaning, can't it? Well, I don't think we need a punctuation. That makes sense without it. So you say, all right, let's eat grandma. It does change everything. Punctuation marks can save a life, by the way. But if I told you today, here's our great commission from Matthew chapter 10. Many w would disagree. Some uh, very, very animately, viciously, if you will, even Matthew here. In Matthew 10, if I said, Jesus, here it is, the Great Commission. Jesus commands us to go and preach that the kingdom of heaven is near and, and to stay away from the Gentiles. Hopefully, you would come to me and say, Preacher, of all people, you need to know that that's out of context, context, context. Jesus commanded the 12 disciples, Go. And it wasn't about us just yet. And to that, I would say, that makes sense. You remember Jesus and the Canaanite woman crying out for mercy for Jesus to help him heal her daughter that was possessed by a demon. And Jesus will reveal why he was sent to this world. In Matthew 15, 24, he tells her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. I'm going to use this phrase, and it's going to be used over and over, so I hope it sinks in. He was saying, first things first. Jesus was on a mission. He had received a commission. In fact, dare we say, he received a great commission. Why not? It was from his Father. It was from God himself. And Jesus was given this commission, this charge to go, but specifically to only the Jews and specifically only to those lost sheep of Israel. Lost, yes, lost. What does that mean? It's those who had strayed from the path that God had them on, those who had strayed from God's perfect law. And why? Well, as we established, it's been over a thousand years of waiting. Where's the king God promised? Where's the kingdom? Here we are. They're in the kingdom, the Roman kingdom, and they're oppressed and they're being persecuted. Where's the kingdom, the forever kingdom that God promised? They're desperate people. And Jesus is sent, evidently, as he reveals by his Father, the commission to go. But I want you to go first to my people, the ones who have strayed, the ones who have become lost. You go to them first and you give them the message. It's time. Turn around and come back. The kingdom of heaven is near. How desperate were they? Remember John chapter 6 and verse 15, Jesus had performed some miracles and, and God's people had talked amongst themselves. And even though Jesus said some things that didn't make sense for them, he did, he did the miracle. So they said, this has to be the one. This is the promised one. The king is here. And Jesus, we're told, he takes off. He, he tries to get away and he, he has to escape to the mountains because he knew that they were going to come and take him and make him be their king by force. That is the move of desperate people waiting for the king that God had promised so many years before. 
And Jesus reveals very specifically he was sent only to God's people and only to those who had given up hope, who decided it wasn't going to happen, who had declared God's laws obsolete. They were lost. And Jesus came to complete that very specific mission, preaching, teaching in the message, repent, get right, the kingdom, the kingdom that God promised, the king that God promised, get ready, it's coming. In other words, he's telling them you need to choose. Time's up. You need to decide. You remember Jesus in the triumphal entry to Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey, and the Scriptures even say that's to fulfill, first things first, to fulfill what was written through the prophet. Behold, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. The crowd shouted as he came in. They had some idea. They shouted, Hosanna, Matthew 21, 9. Hosanna to the son of David. That's what they shouted. Remember, the promise was to David that it would come through his lineage. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And Hosanna meaning, save us, save us now. Revealing They want him to be their king. Imagine Matthew 24. The the passage we talked about a few weeks back, Jesus and his disciples had had been in the temple. And coming out, the disciples were pointing out, look how magnificent this this temple is. Look how magnificent all these buildings are. And, And Jesus is going to say, not for long. Not one stone will be left on another. This has the disciples' attention, basically. What are you talking about? Or they say, when? When will this happen? What are the signs? Tell us. Tell us what to look for. When is this going to happen? And and Jesus tells them some things, some details, and they're terrible things that are going to come. But he tells them that it must happen before the Son of Man can come. He tells them that this temple will be destroyed. But then he tells them something very important concerning all that he reveals. In Matthew 24 and verse 14, he says all these terrible things are going to happen, but know this, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Never forget, he's establishing and reminding them first things first. We started off with what God promised. The first thing first is going to have to be the king needs to come. The one that's going to be the king forever. That's first. And then that message is going to have to go out to all of God's people. And understand when Jesus came, the first part of that message, that commission, was to go to those who had strayed to the lost sheep of Israel and only the lost sheep. And then he's revealing this one. He's adding to this prophecy. He's adding to the the plan of God of what's going to happen next. He's saying the temple is going to be destroyed. But before it's destroyed, he tells them some things that are going to happen. And in those things, the one that he points out that I want us to focus on this morning is the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. What end? Well, he's telling them the end that involves the temple. Hold that thought. In Luke 18, toward the end of Jesus' life on this earth and his mission, he'll tell his disciples in verse 31 through 34, we're going up to Jerusalem. Everything that's written by the prophets about me, the Son of Man, will be fulfilled. It's a reminder, first things first. Everything will be fulfilled for us today. That means that everything we read about back there in that first part, that old part of our Bible, all of those are talking about Jesus. And Jesus tells his disciple that he's going to have to go and he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles. And they're going to mock him. They're going to insult him. They're going to spit on him. They're going to flog him. And they're going to kill him. And on the third day, he'll rise again. And I love what the disciples, how they responded and the insight we're given through that passage in Luke 18, verse 34. It tells us the disciples didn't understand any of it. They didn't understand a word. They had no idea. I can just see them talking to my, oh, okay, sure, sure, or whatever. And then everything happened exactly as the prophets had written. 
Jesus is handed over to the Gentiles. And Jesus is crucified and raised from the dead. He appears to his disciples. They still didn't believe it was him. And Jesus tells them again in Luke 24, This is what I told you while I was still with you. This is what I told you. Everything must be fulfilled. First things first. What were they? Jesus is coming as the king to fulfill the promise of God that was given a thousand years earlier. That's the first thing. But in order to accomplish that, he's been given the mission to go to those who have become lost of Israel, the lost sheep, the Jews who had lost hope and lost faith and lost their commitment to the law of God. And he's given them the message to repent, get right, the kingdom is near. Then something else has to happen. All these things will take place leading up to the destruction of the temple. The destruction of the temple must take place first things first before the kingdom that will last forever can be officially established. Everything must be fulfilled that was written, Jesus says, in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms. I always like to give people the homework assignment to say he's he's revealing this is Jesus talking everything that was written about him. Have you ever gone back and did that study on your own? Can you write down all the different things written from the prophets and from the law of Moses and from the Psalms talking about Jesus? This will be a good opportunity to try. But now something different. In this case, verse 45, then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the Scriptures. He had to help them. And then He's going to tell them, the Christ, the Messiah, the King, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And here comes the so what from Jesus to His disciples. Another thing's going to have to take place. In verse 47, he says, Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Why? First things first. It comes to the Jews first. And he says, You'll be witnesses of all these things. And as we read the story, we know everything's going to happen just as Jesus told them. He's crucified, raised from the dead, and now the stage is set in the context, if we'll stay there, for what happens next in Matthew 28, then verse 16 and following. We're told that the eleven, if you'll turn in your Bibles, they went up on the mountain to see Jesus. And, and Jesus tells them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why? Because it is finished. He completed his mission of offering his life as the sacrifice so that all of creation can be made right again with God if they choose He says, this is what I want you to do then. I I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. In Mark's gospel, he says, go into all the world and and baptizing them and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. He's going to remind them God's promise has been fulfilled. That's number one. First things first. That's why he was sent. He is the king that will reign on David's throne forever over a kingdom that will last forever. That has to take place. Then the message has to go to God's people first because that's who the promise was with from God. And then it's going to go out. He says, I'm going to send you out so that this message, what has just happened here, you understand all of the Jews that weren't there, how are they going to know what Jesus did and that Jesus is the king? Someone has to tell them. So Jesus in this commission, another commission, is sending them out and saying, you're going to go, you're going to preach to fulfill what? What he told them in Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. What end? The temple's going to be destroyed. First things first. So they go out. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus, he's going to answer the question first. The group's going to come together and says, okay, so, so how about now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, not yet. Here's what's going to happen. I want you to stay in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit, and then you're going to go. You're going to be my witnesses, and I want you to start in Jerusalem. And then you're going to go out into all the world. You're going to go in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. All of God's people need to know what happened. And first things first, it goes to the Jew first. 
letting them know that God has in fact fulfilled His promise to them about their forever king. First things first. So they go out. Now many will stop right there because they'll take a look at Matthew 28, 16, the Great Commission. It's got a label. It's a heading. It must be. And they'll say, this is Jesus. He's commanded us to go into all the world to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel. Well, yes, that's a good, very good thing to do. But can you connect it to that particular passage is the question this morning. Jesus commanded, if I use Matthew 10, where he said, I want you to go out and preach, to repent, the kingdom is near, and don't go to the Gentiles. And I said, that's the commission. He said, no, no, that's, well, why, why is that not the great commission applying to us? And then just a few chapters later, it's Jesus telling the disciples, you need to go and preach. And then that one is us. Let's talk about the Scriptures and let the Scriptures interpret Scriptures. What happens next? Let's read what happens next. They go out and they start preaching and teaching. And, and, and Paul is going to give such great insight. The Apostle Paul, uh, he's going to say and to the Romans in, in Romans 1 verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. To the Jew first... Then the Gentiles. He understands first things first. The command was given by Jesus for them to go to all nations, to all world, preach the gospel. Jesus is the king promised by God. He's arrived. God's promise is fulfilled. That was first. Then to the people, the lost people, the lost Jews, the sheep of Israel that are strayed from the path. He's talked to them to repent. And then to his disciples, get the message out. I gave my life and God raised me from the dead. It's time. They need to choose. Get that to God's people, the Jews first. So what happens? Starting in Jerusalem and all throughout Judea and Samaria, Paul will tell the church in Colossae how happy the apostles are that the church had put their faith in Christ Jesus, that they, in Colossians 1, 6, that they believed the word of truth, they believed the gospel which had come to them as it had also in all the world. What did he just say? He tells them, we're so glad you obeyed the gospel that's come to you just as it has to all the world. Paul will remind them about the supremacy of Christ and, and reminding them of their journey of faith from being enemies of God to being children of God and because of their obedience to the gospel. And what does he tell them about the gospel? In, in Colossians 1.23, he tells them the gospel that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I am a, a servant. Question, how do you interpret or understand the word has been proclaimed? He didn't say it will be proclaimed. It has been proclaimed. To who? To every creature under heaven. It has been. In Romans 10 and verse 16, Paul will tell the Romans that, that not all Israelites will accept the good news, and they did. And then Paul will say, why not? Was it because they didn't hear about the good news? Maybe this was that part that that gospel message didn't get preached to the ends of the earth. And Paul will say, of course not. They heard. They heard the good news. They heard the gospel of the kingdom because the gospel of the kingdom has gone out, he says, into all the earth. Their words have gone out into the ends of the earth, not will go out. Paul tells the church in Rome that the gospel, in Romans 16, verse 26, he tells them the gospel has been made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all nations according to the commandments of God. The Great Commission evidently has been fulfilled in the context of what it was given for to God's people specifically so that they could choose, so that they would know first. The Great Commission, first things first, accomplish one final passage. All that remains now, what are they waiting for? Okay, if this is the gospel message and Paul has proclaimed, it has gone to the end of the earth. No one, none of God's people can have an excuse. They've all heard. Can you imagine? That's what Paul says over and over 
It has been preached. It has reached the end of the earth. It has been given to all nations. God's people have been given the choice. Jesus is the king. The only thing left now is what? Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. Here's our so what. In Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are in Pisidian Antioch. And they go to the synagogue, as is their custom. They're going to the Jews first. And they're invited to speak. And Paul will stand up and he will give a history lesson. And toward the end of that, he's going to tell them about Jesus and what took place back in Jerusalem. And in verse 32, Paul will say, We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. First things first. What did they want? A king. Paul is telling them, fulfilled. So what remains? They, they have this king that's going to reign on David's throne forever. And Jesus is that king. And then in verse 38, Paul will tell them, through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from everything you couldn't be justified from by the law of Moses. What did that require? The temple. And then the only question, do you believe? Will you choose Jesus as your king? And as a result of, of their teaching, some will believe, but others refused. And others formed a little mob again and they spoke abusive, abusively against Paul and what he said. And then it tells us their response. Paul and Barnabas will answer them, and I love the word, boldly. In verse 46, Paul and Barnabas will say, we had to speak the word of God to you first. First things first. And since you've rejected it, and since you don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we'll now turn to the Gentiles. For the Lord commanded that we've been made a light for the Gentiles. The Lord commanded that we can bring salvation to the ends of the earth, including the Gentiles. And take very special note in verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Now you've got your goosebumps. And now may I say, that's why if I could put the headings in the chapter headings in the Bible, I'd put my heading right there. The Greater Commission. That's us. We're into the story. First things first had to happen. And our challenge this morning that I pray we grow in our understanding of is that we're not to try to put ourselves in place in the history where we weren't. Stay in our place and get ready for the most awesome, incredible thing that God has done. Have your moment of goosebumps in realizing this whole plan had to take place first things first. The king that he had promised, his people specifically and exclusively, had to be fulfilled. Jesus came. God sent him. He will be that king. But then comes the kingdom. And in order for the kingdom to take place, Jesus is going to have to give his life as the sacrifice so that the sacrifices of animals are no longer needed to become right with God. And that will all be accomplished and fulfilled because the next thing that happens now that the gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth and all nations in that context, the temple will be destroyed. And it was in 70 AD. And it is not coming back. For us today, I pray we will be the people that are filled with goosebumps over knowing where our place in the story was. And is that God sent that king. Yes, first things first, but we're included. We're included in the greater commission. And now we go wherever we are to be the light in the world of darkness. If you've not given your life and have obeyed that gospel, the good news, I would encourage you to make that decision today. To confess Jesus is Lord. He is king. 
And he gave his life for you and God raised him from the dead. To turn around, repent, and to give your life to God and let him be in charge. To be immersed in the waters of baptism. To have all your sins washed away. And to be raised up in newness. Become a new creature in life. May God bless us as we continue to be that light in the world. Until next time, keep the faith.